The 1979 Ohio State football season would be notable if for no other reason than it was the first time in 28 years that someone other than Woody Hayes would be leading the Buckeyes. But under the direction of first-year coach Earl Bruce, a tightly knit band of underestimated upstarts shocked the college football world by posting an undefeated regular season and rising to the top of the polls. By the end of the year, they had firmly established themselves as one of the greatest teams in Ohio State football history. The 1979 Ohio State football season was a time of new beginnings, of unexpected success, and enduring excellence. The 1979 season really exceeded everybody's expectations. Nobody expected Ohio State to be 11-0 in the regular season. I would have to think it probably exceeded the coaches' expectations. We were picked uh, fifth or sixth in, in the conference in 1979. I thought, oh goodness gracious, what kind of season are we going to have here? A lot wasn't really expected of us because of the year that we had previously. But we knew we had a good football team and we just took it upon ourselves to say, okay, let's prove everybody wrong. And we did. Spurred on by an early season upset of UCLA, the 79 Buckeyes stormed through the Big Ten schedule. A dramatic come from behind win at Michigan clinched the Big Ten title and vaulted them to the top of the wire service polls. Only a last minute, one point defeat in the Rose Bowl kept the Buckeyes from completing one of college football's most stunning seasons. That team was on a mission. Nobody thought we were gonna do anything. We were one point away, and Ohio State hasn't been that close to win a national championship since they won a national championship in 68. The success of the 79 season came on the heels, however, of one of the most turbulent episodes in the history of Ohio State football, the firing of Coach Woody Hayes. On the night of December 30th, 1978, Hayes punched Clemson player Charlie Bauman after the linebacker had intercepted an arch Easter pass in the closing minutes of the Gator Bowl. The interception sealed the Buckeyes' defeat that night the punch sealed Hayes' fate. We basically knew that he had sort of sealed his own doom at this time. And it was sad, but you could, you could feel it in the air. You, could, you knew something had to be done. Getting on the plane, flying back to Columbus, um, uh, when we landed, they had already fired Woody. And he got up in front of the plane and on the speaker system of the plane and announced to us that he would no longer be the coach at Ohio State. And, you know, it just went silent. Guys just sat there kind of stunned. And uh, I don't think anybody got off that plane for 45 minutes to an hour. The episode was a painful climax to a difficult season, one which saw the Buckeyes lose four games, including a third straight loss to Michigan. One of the coaches on that team was George Chomp, who was the offensive backfield coach. And George told me later, he said, we could see it that entire year. He said he had a look in his eyes all during that year, and it was, it was what we as assistant coach were talking about, a super megaton. He said we knew he was going to blow his top somewhere, but we didn't know whether it was going to be in the locker room, whether it was going to be on the practice field, whether it was going to be during a game, just where it was going to be. And that incident with, uh, with Clemson was just uh, the one that, that's what uh, lit the fuse under the bomb. And he said, it just, we, but he said we could see it coming all season long. Hayes' dismissal forced the university to do something it hadn't had to do in almost 30 years, find a new head football coach. Speculation began almost immediately, and one name quickly came to the forefront. Everyone was saying Lou Holtz, and we had heard so many great things about Lou Holtz that, you know, it became a, a little theme song, you know. Lou Holtz is the coach. Lou Holtz is the coach, and so, you know, everyone was riding on that Lou Holtz thing. Holtz had served as an assistant for Hayes in Ohio State's 1968 National Championship squad and had gone on to become a successful high-profile head coach. But in spite of the rampant rumors, the Ohio-born Holtz demurred and declined to even interview for the position. With Holtz out of the picture, athletic director Hugh Heinemann, also an assistant in 1968, turned his attention to yet another member of that coaching staff, Earl Bruce. I considered Hugh Heinemann, who was the athletic director, a great friend. 
And my athletic director used to be the defensive coordinator at Ohio State, Lou McCullen, and he thought I should be the coach right away and I should apply for the job. And I almost said, Lou, I think you're trying to kick me out of Iowa State. Uh, uh, but I did call you and say, if, uh, uh, if you're taking things, I'm interested in the job and let it go at that. Bruce had played briefly for Hayes and the Buckeyes back in the early 50s before an injured knee cut his career short. Still in spite of his Buckeye background, Bruce's name wasn't exactly at the top of the fans' wish list. There was a lot of speculation in different, in different directions, and Earl wasn't, I don't think Earl was always in the forefront. Uh, in fact, he never was in the forefront, really, and then his name came up. And, but his success at Iowa State certainly indicated that whoa, he was worthy. As a head coach, Bruce had proven himself by turning around struggling programs at both Iowa State and Tampa. In Ohio, he was still remembered by the state's high school coaches for winning two state titles and going 20-0 as head coach of high school power Massillon, Washington. For Heinemann and the university, Bruce had all the right credentials. And on January 12, 1979, Earl Bruce was named the 20th head football coach in Ohio State's history. For close followers of college football, the selection was seen as a winner. But to many of the returning players, Bruce was an unknown quantity. And when they announced Earl Bruce, I said, Earl, who? Because I never knew Earl. I never, didn't know anything about Iowa State or Earl Bruce or his history here at Ohio State. And so everything was new. And I mean, he came in, he had a tough road to hope. I mean, could you imagine following Woody Hayes in 28 years of tradition, football? You know, this guy's God in the state of Ohio. You know, I don't know if I'd want to follow him in footsteps. We didn't know much about Earl, and, and uh, so it took some time for us to adjust to him. And, and even though he wanted to carry on the tradition and, and the things that Woody did, he wasn't Woody Hayes, and, and no one could fill the shoes of Woody Hayes. As the Ohio State Buckeyes prepared to open the 1979 season, one question surrounded the team. Would Ohio State football ever be the same without Woody Hayes as coach? As you look back in 1979, I think the preseason expectations uh, weren't so much where Ohio State would end up in the national rankings or in the Big Ten rankings. Really, the entire attention uh, on the Ohio State football program would be, what is Ohio State football going to be like without Woody Hayes on the sidelines? Hayes built his football dynasty with a reliance on rushing the football, passing only when necessary. He didn't like throwing, that's for sure. I look back at some of the stats, it's amazing. We threw the ball seven times, and Woody said that was too many times. <laughs> so, you know, when you see the low numbers of receivers and everything, it's not that guys, we didn't have guys that could catch. That just wasn't his style. He believed in pounding and beating on people and running the ball down their throat. But by the late 70s, college football had become more diverse. And many fans hoped the new regime would come armed with new ideas. When Earl came in, it was a little different because you were looking to make the big play. You know, we were quick enough where somebody made a mistake, we had the speed behind us. So we attacked more. Certainly Earl inherited a lot of talent with Art Schleister, who was coming into his sophomore season. But uh, his two wide receivers, uh, who really were converted uh, backs from their high school days, uh, Gary Williams had been a quarterback, and of course Doug Donnelly was an outstanding halfback, and they were now playing the wide receiver positions, and they were excellent. And we had some very talented people at skilled positions, and Earl Bruce was a coach that was open to that. That really opened it up, and Art could really utilize his abilities more, and uh, we became a much different team to contend with. Schleister arrived on campus the year before as the nation's most prized recruit, but his freshman year produced mixed results as the team struggled to integrate Schleister's talent into Woody's conservative game plan. You can't change a whole tradition or complexion or personality of a football team, and, you know, bringing in a freshman to play in Big Ten football, uh, that was you know, quite a change. Earl Bruce bought in a, a different type of offense that was really um, sort of more fitting to 
to Art Sleester style. You know, fall back in the pocket, you know, pick your receivers and bam, 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 like that. And so it was more fitting for Art Sleester style at that particular time. And it made Art Sleester look a lot better. But Sleester and the New Look Buckeyes were unproven commodities and preseason prognosticators had low expectations. Certainly, I don't think any of the polls had us anywhere close to being number one uh, in the uh, nation, or even the Big Ten for that matter. I think we were as low as number four in the Big Ten in some of the polls. So we didn't read too many papers, and we weren't really too interested in what the media had to say, but we knew we had a, we had a tall order in front of us. The Buckeyes debuted with an impressive 31-8 victory over Syracuse. But their first taste of adversity came quickly. The very next game, we go up to Minnesota, and they come out with a run-and-shoot offense, which I don't believe Ohio State had seen to that point. And uh, it took us about three quarters to get a handle on what was going on. And we barely escaped from Minnesota with a win. So that puts some doubts in people's mind. And I'm sure there are some doubts in the players' minds as well. So how really good are we? A 45-29 win over lightly regarded Washington State proved the offense could score, but concerns about the defense remain. The following week, the Buckeyes flew west to Los Angeles to face their first major test, the UCLA Bruins. Led by two All-Americans, safety Kenny Easley and running back Freeman McNeil, the Bruins came into the game as prohibitive favorites. Well, we knew they had a great running game, and we knew they had a great defense, and we knew that they were going to be very, very physical. We knew that we had to play our best game and stay, keep the game close. Showing unexpected toughness on defense, the Buckeyes hung neck and neck with the Bruins. As the game moved into the fourth quarter, the teams were tied at 10. But early in the fourth, UCLA's Peter Bormeister kicked a 38-yard field goal, and the Bruins took the lead by three. With just 2.21 left in the game, the Buckeyes look finished. Starting from their own 20, Schleister and the offense went to work. Passing with a precision never before seen at Ohio State, the OSU offense marched steadily down the field, executing the two-minute drill to perfection. Schleister connected on five consecutive pass attempts, taking the Buckeyes all the way to the Bruins' three-yard line. On second down from the two, the Buckeyes shocked the Bruins once again. Figuring UCLA would be looking for the run, Schleister faked to his tailback, then tossed the ball to a wide open Paul Campbell. Man, they sent everybody but the kitchen sink. My job was to take a couple steps down, block down, come back out, release, wide open. It was a beautiful call. That was a drive that pumped everybody up. That was probably, that was the drive that changed the season. We were trying to find identity, and we just steamrolled after that. That drive is where our football team grew up so that they could win the championship. On the heels of their stunning last-minute upset of UCLA, the 1979 Ohio State Buckeyes sensed that even without Woody Hayes, the program would continue its winning ways. We've got confidence now. We go in saying, we're Ohio State Buckeyes. We're the Buckeyes now. When you come play against us, you might as well strap your hand on for, for three hours, three and a half hours. It's going to be a dog fight. Armed with a newfound confidence, the 79 Buckeyes turned their attention to the Big Ten schedule. One by one, the conference foes fell. And with each passing win, the Buckeyes rose higher and higher in the polls. As they headed into their season finale with Michigan, the Buckeyes were 10-0 and ranked number two in the country. We went into that game with so much confidence and so much intensity that, you know, we knew we could go out there and win, and we should win this football game. We knew we could pass the ball, we knew we could run the ball, you know, we knew our defense was playing well, so, uh, there was less apprehension going into that game, I think, than, than any other game that we played that year, just because we were peaking at the right time. To beat Michigan, the Buckeyes would need all the momentum they could get. The Wolverines, led by tailback Butch Woolfolk and freshman sensation receiver Anthony Carter, enter the game having won three in a row over the Buckeyes. To make matters worse, the Ohio State offense was unable to muster even one touchdown 
in any of those three games. Looking for inspiration, Coach Bruce called in a very special guest for his team's last practice, the traditional senior tackle. Woody took the moment and ran with it. We knew, but he began to reemphasize that the significance about senior tackle and how important it was for that person to get that, that one more tackle, tackle that dummy that one more time his senior year. And so I thought it was, it showed class for a coach to step aside and allow a former coach to be coach again for that moment. He talks about the, the, a little bit of the Michigan game, the history of the Michigan game, and what it means to win that football game, and what football, like always, what football means to each individual. It, it, it was like no other football game that you ever played in, and, and that all had to do with Coach Hayes. Instilled with Woody's spirit, the Buckeyes took the field in Ann Arbor. The game immediately assumed the feel of a classic, as both clubs played with a hard-hitting abandon that always characterizes the brutal intensity of the game. An early stop on fourth down from the one kept the Wolverines off the scoreboard and gave the Buckeyes confidence. The game remained scoreless deep into the second quarter before OSU kicker Vlada Janikiewski broke the ice with a 22-yard field goal. But Michigan struck back when the dangerous Carter got behind the Buckeyes secondary and hauled in a 57-yard touchdown strike from John Wangler. The Buckeyes answered the Michigan touchdown with a rapid-fire seven-play drive that culminated with another Janikiewski field goal with just eight seconds remaining in the half. But with their touchdown-less streak now at 14 quarters, Buckeyes knew that field goals alone would not beat Michigan. We knew somewhere along the line somebody was going to do something that was going to spring us to get us going, because we had a, um, a phobia over us that we couldn't even score a touchdown. On their opening second half drive, the Buckeyes finally broke through. When Art Sleister's pass caromed off the hands of defender Mike Jolly, tight end Chuck Hunter was there for a circus catch. The 19-yard connection broke the touchdown jinx and gave the Buckeyes the lead. And that was the first one in three years. It meant a lot to have a touchdown rather than get a field goal up there. I mean, you were not going to win the win ball games with field goals against Michigan. And uh, that has been proven. A failed two-point conversion kept the score at 12-7 Ohio State. Another long bomb to Carter, however, set up another Michigan touchdown. And as the game headed into the final quarter, the Buckeyes found themselves trailing 15 to 12 and in need of a big play. With the ball on the Michigan 38-yard line, the Buckeyes brought 10 men to the line. Senior co-captain Jim Laughlin broke through and blocked the kick. And safety Todd Bell picked up the loose ball and raced in for the score. I didn't see the block. I just heard a boom, boom. It was like boom, boom. And you knew that someone had blocked the ball. And I was there, and I just picked it up and just darted. That was the, the play that people remember. Uh, that's the one that sticks out in my mind as to the 79 o OSU Michigan game was that block punt. The OSU defense clamped down the rest of the way and the Wolverine offense never crossed midfield again. Marcus Merrick's interception ended Michigan's last desperate bid. And when Arch Sleister took a knee to end the game, the Buckeyes were officially Rose Bowl bound. In the Rose Bowl, the Buckeyes faced one of college football's best teams ever, the powerful and talented USC Trojans. The 1979 Trojans were a dominating outfit led by superstars like Anthony Munoz, Ronnie Lott, Marcus Allen, and that season's Heisman Trophy winner, Charles White. Despite all that talent, the Buckeyes led late into the fourth quarter. Only a last minute touchdown by White vaulted the Trojans to a 17-16 win. Even the narrow loss to USC could not mar what had been an amazing season, a season which saw the Buckeyes rise from tragic circumstances and low expectations to the Big Ten Championship within seconds of the national title. It was the kind of season that even Woody Hayes would have been proud of. The 1979 Buckeyes were the last Ohio State team to finish the regular season undefeated. In recognition, Earl Bruce was the overwhelming selection as college football's coach of the year. 
Not bad for a man who just one year earlier was sometimes referred to as Earl who? For Buckeye Classics, I'm Archie Griffin. Thanks for watching.